Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we take a look at the role of government in the First World War. We hear first from Professor George Peden about the growth of cabinet government. I'm George Peden, Emeritus Professor of History at Stirling University. My particular interest is where history and economics meet. I'm also interested in where politics meets economics. Before the First World War, cabinet government was very different from what we might expect. In 1914 and down to 1916, there was no cabinet agenda, No cabinet minutes. The Prime Minister at the end of the meeting would write a letter in longhand to the King saying what had been decided and he would keep a copy but no other minister would have any record of what had been decided in cabinet. This is not the way we would run a golf club now. If a minister was in doubt as to what had been decided he would ask his private secretary, a civil servant, to phone the Prime Minister's private secretary to find out what had been decided. This was an extremely relaxed way of governing the country. On the other hand, ministers were much less free to spend money in 1914 than they would be now. They had to agree with the Chancellor of the Exchequer precisely how much money they could spend in the coming year, and they had to spend that money for purposes that Parliament had voted. During the war, that system lapsed, at least for departments who were responsible for conducting the war, the War Office and the Admiralty, because they could spend money which had been borrowed by the government, money which was voted in very general terms by Parliament, so that they could spend money as fast as they could, and the Cabinet had no financial means of controlling what they did or setting priorities. So, though in 1914 there was very little coordination at the level of Cabinet meeting, there was a great deal of coordination at the level of public expenditure. And in some ways, the government was on a tighter rein then than now. The Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith, was in many ways the epitome of relaxed politics. He would, during the course of a meeting, if the discussion didn't seem to be very interesting, he would take time off and write a letter, perhaps to his mistress, perhaps draft a parliamentary answer for the next day's meeting in the House of Commons, and let the discussion go on while he was doing this. He was not, in some ways, an ideal chairman. His successor, Lloyd George, wasn't ideal either, but for a rather different reason. Lloyd George would simply ignore the agenda and discuss whatever interested him. The meetings could be extremely disorganised. Eventually, the person who pulled the politicians into some semblance of order was, as you might expect, a soldier, or as accurately a marine, a man called Morris Hankey, who became a bureaucrat, he became the cabinet secretary, and it was he who introduced the idea of having an agenda and having type conclusions to be circulated to all relevant parties. That was, in many ways, a revolution in British government. Morris Hankey, before the war, had been secretary of a body called the Committee of Imperial Defence, which brought together politicians and the leading soldiers and sailors He did keep minutes and printed conclusions for that committee, but the cabinet continued with the 18th century method. During the war, Asquith realised that sometimes questions had to be discussed in smaller bodies than the full cabinet, so he set up a war council, and it and its successors had Hankey as secretary. So when Lloyd George took over the government from Asquith and decided to have a small war cabinet, he took on Hankey as secretary as well. So Hankey simply progressed from the pre-war Committee of Imperial Defence to becoming the secretary of the War Cabinet. The War Cabinet was quite different from the full cabinet. A full cabinet would consist of over 20 ministers. The War Cabinet under Lloyd George had sometimes as few as five and never more than seven ministers. So in a way, cabinet government shrank during the war. The body of people taking the key decisions was much reduced. Though in fact... The number of people in the room might be many more than seven, because while the war cabinet sat, they would be joined by the heads of the armed forces and maybe some of their subordinates, 
any minister whose department was affected by what the War Cabinet was discussing would also be there. So sometimes, though the War Cabinet might only have five people in it, there might be 30 people in the room and scarcely enough room to sit in. Lloyd George felt he needed advice, more than the advice that the civil service would give him, so that he recruited outsiders, academics and journalists. And these people were located in outbuildings in Downing Street, which became known as the Garden Suburb. The activities of the cabinet during the war grew considerably. New departments had to be formed and new functions for government. The first big change was the creation of a Ministry of Munitions, which, under Lloyd George, was responsible for increasing production of things like shells, guns, and so on. Hitherto, prices were fixed by the market. Under Lloyd George, the Ministry of Munitions began to fix prices for the goods that were being produced. Or more particularly, they would say that profits could only be a certain percentage of the cost of the goods that were being produced. This encouraged producers of these goods to pay high prices to subcontractors. So the government then had to start controlling the subcontractors' prices, and gradually price controls fed through the economy. So what had been a liberal market economy became more like a command economy during the war. Lloyd George also had to recruit many new people into the munitions industry, many of them women. And so the government became much more concerned with workers' welfare than it ever had been before. Down to 1916, the cabinet and the War Council and its successors were exclusively concerned with fighting and strategy. But by 1916, food shortages and related shipping shortages forced the government to turn its attention to the home front. Shipping and food are related. There were two sources for the shipping shortage. One was the British Armed Forces made a lot of use of merchant ships to transport troops and supplies abroad, and that left fewer ships for civilian use. The second, of course, was the German U-boats, which sank many of our ships. So by March 1916, there was a food shortage, and the government had to be concerned with food supplies, boosting production in Britain, of course, but increasingly becoming concerned with the distribution of food itself. Prices were fixed for certain goods, but fixing prices without controlling demand simply creates queues. There were some spectacular queues outside shops. If there was a rumour that there might be some margarine, you might get a mile-long queue outside. Such a queue was reported in the Times in December 1917. And when one turns to the War Cabinet Minutes, one finds the Minister of Food alerting the Cabinet to how these queues and the food shortage were creating industrial unrest. So the cabinet decides to have rationing of food, and by the end of the war, the government was responsible for about 85% of the nation's food supplies. Once more, one's moved from a market economy to something like a command economy. Dealing with the food shortage was one aspect of maintaining morale. Originally, morale had been thought of something as concerning soldiers, but in a total war, as the First World War was, the morale of the civil population became important too. People who were undergoing hardship during the war, the hardship of being separated from a husband, of working in a munitions factory, a shortage of food, expected to be rewarded for this. The government took an interest in public morale and found out there was an expectation that life should be better after the war than it had been in 1914. People were concerned about housing shortages. Women who had found employment were anxious about what would happen to women's employment after the war when the men came home. Soldiers, particularly in rural districts, wanted a fairer distribution of land. They wanted access to small holdings. So the government set up a Ministry of Reconstruction to look at these questions. The biggest and most expensive question by far was the housing shortage. The war itself had created a housing shortage Housing hadn't been very satisfactory in many places, even in 1914. But the effect of the war was almost a complete cessation of house building, as men went off to fight in the front, as the particular skills required in house building were required by government for war purposes. So you have a period of four or five years in which no houses are built. You can imagine what that does to the housing supply. One of the key questions for the Ministry of Reconstruction was what to be done about housing. And with some complaints from the Conservatives in the coalition, 
the idea of having a government subsidised housing programme is adopted and is implemented from 1919. The government financed the war largely by promising to repay loans after the war. And the government also maintained morale by promising to spend more money after the war on things like housing. In some ways, these promises were incompatible because they couldn't repay loans and spend more money on houses simultaneously. So when at the end of the war, the government finds that there's a problem with inflation, all the government borrowing has created more money and prices have gone up, the government in 1919 decides to reintroduce the pre-1914 system of treasury control. Once more, the Chancellor can restrict expenditure. The housing programme gets off to a good start, but by 1921, it's been cut back severely in order for the Chancellor to balance his budget. So in the end, the war didn't have quite such dramatic effects on what Lloyd George called a nation fit for heroes, as people hoped. People were tired of rising prices in 1918, 1919, and often blamed government extravagance. The press generally made a great deal about government extravagance. And looking at the cabinet minutes, one finds a very serious discussion by ministers about whether they should each be allowed a motor car and a chauffeur. So the Ministry of Reconstruction had to work in a context where government expenditure was seen as something a burden on the taxpayer, and therefore people realise that choices had to be made and not every taxpayer was willing to pay for housing or other improvements. So long as government could pay for expenditure by borrowing, and as long as people didn't realise that that was what was causing prices to rise, then everybody could have everything they wanted. There could be more shells for the soldiers, more ships for the admirals, and the government would deal with shortages for the civil population as best it could. When peace came and the government once more had to balance its books, it became much more obvious that government expenditure meant extra taxation. Taxes had risen during the war, but people didn't expect to keep at that level. Income tax, for example, increased fivefold between 1914 and 1918, and people in 1919 expected income tax to fall, not be maintained to pay for government expenditure on reconstruction. The First World War forced cabinet government to expand into areas which governments had not previously interfered. Before 1914, Britain had been essentially a laissez-faire country. It became much more a command economy by 1918. Socialism, if you like. And, of course, there was a real threat of a particular form of socialism with the Russian Revolution and a good deal of industrial discontent in this country. But because government had solved problems like the shipping shortage, the food shortage, government had even taken over the railways at the outbreak of war, people had an expanded idea of what government could do. Government had done almost nothing about housing before 1914. Even though expenditure on housing was cut back in 1921, governments remained responsible and were blamed for housing shortages. And so throughout the interwar period, governments subsidised housing. It's something that would have been inconceivable before 1914. There were other improvements too. There was an Education Act in 1918 because recruiting soldiers revealed just how undereducated the British people were. And so the minimum school leaving age was increased from 12 to 14. You might find 12 rather low, but my grandfather left school at 12 and was perfectly literate. But that was perhaps not the case with everybody who left school at 12. There was even talk of a national health service at the end of the war, but that was something that didn't materialise until after the Second World War. Still, the need to maintain morale on the home front during the First World War greatly expanded the agenda of government after the war and until this day. That was Professor George Peden on the growth of cabinet government during the First World War. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn.
In our next podcast, we hear from Professor Heather Jones about the monarchy during the First World War.